Welcome everyone, this is Fighting Regressions with Benchmarking and Continuous Integration. I'm Dustin, that's Chris, and we work on Jetpack libraries. Now, early this year, released Jetpack Benchmark, um, which is an awesome library and tool that's gonna help you measure performance in app code. And we did a talk at I.O. We talked a lot about how the library works and what it can do for you. But what we didn't talk so much about was how we actually use this internally within Jetpack. And it's been really helpful for us, especially for performance sensitive projects like Compose. And so we wanted to share some of that value with you and hopefully um, you come away with some useful knowledge. Okay, so story time. Who doesn't love story time? Um, so here's kind of like a little lifespan of a benchmark. So each of the blue dots represent a build or a set of changes that might have made your benchmark perform better or worse. And along the y-axis we have performance, so how long the benchmark took to run. In this case, like higher is worse. Benchmark took longer to run. And so here you can see we're developing, we're developing, things are going great, and of course this wouldn't be a useful example unless we actually hit a regression. And as you can see from a cursory glance, uh, things definitely got much worse after that build highlighted by the red line. Now, this is actually a real example, so we can actually look at the code. It turns out this is a benchmark for, uh, this is an initialization benchmark for a class called Greedy Scheduler in the Work Manager class. And this is just its constructor. It doesn't really matter what the class does um, for the context of this example, but you can see here that it's just some basic assignments. We're creating a simple Java object, no harm done. Um, but the, the actual regression added this line here, get process name. Now, during code review, we thought this would be a relatively quick thing, it'd be fast, no problem. Turns out, no, there's a huge regression, it's an issue. Fortunately, it's only needed in this method called schedule. And that happens after initialization, so we're happy to just move it down, make it lazy, problem solved, regression fixed. Yay! Uh, but the key takeaway I really want uh, to pass on here is that hindsight's 2020. Regressions are rarely obvious. I think we as developers tend to think of performance as kind of like an afterthought, afterthought, right? There's this old saying where like, Premature optimizations is something you want to be worried about. And, and that's kind of true, there's some value in that, but then what happens is we, we, we often like neglect performance entirely. And it ends up being really cumbersome and, and painful to like have to deal with at the end of a dev cycle. Maybe your quality assurance team or someone dog food in the app mentions, hey, there's this key interaction or this feature that's like kind of jank, kind of slow. You, build, you pull out all your profiling tools, you search up Google, like what, what should I do? And you have to dig through thousands and thousands of lines of changes to figure out what went wrong. And compare that to the example we just saw, maintaining performance is actually a much easier thing to do. And what we really want to do is run benchmarks after every change. And that's helped us a lot um, within Jetpack. But, so benchmarks are great, but how, how do we write them? So our solution to this is Jetpack Benchmark. And as I mentioned earlier, we did a full deep talk about this at I.O. Um, but I'm just going to kind of go over like a very quick rundown here just for the uninitiated. So here's a simple Android instrument to test. It's called Simple Scroll. This is going to be a UI benchmark. Um, and we're going to use uh, the activity test rule here to launch an activity. It's going to handle all that activity lifecycle stuff for us. Uh, it's going to be a UI test, so we need to run it on the UI thread. Uh, we're going to get a handle to our recycle view, um, get the height of the last item, and then scroll by that amount. So just a simple instrument to test that scrolls by the height of one item. Now, to actually measure this, we're going to get an instance of our benchmark rule, which comes from the Jetpack benchmark library, and then take all the code that we want to measure and wrap it in this measure repeated loop. And the library is going to handle looping over this code until it's confident that it has a stable result. So that's great. And because it's an instrumented test, we can run this directly in Studio and get the results directly in our ID. So that's nice too. But that all seems pretty simple, right? Like, why have a whole library out this? Like, everybody knows how to write a while loop. Um, well, we've got a bunch of baked in tricks for, for stability. So we're going to handle things like CPU throttling, thread priority, warm up for JIT, and those are just a few examples. Um, we've also got a bunch of configuration checks um, to make sure that you're optimizing something that's actually going to end up um, paying off to your end users, right? Like not something that's just going to get optimized away by R8, for example. Um, and because we, we're Googlers, we get to work directly with the Studio team, and so we've got some pretty tight-knit integration with Studio, and it's going to help you iterate faster on those benchmarks. So that's great. Um, but benchmarks aren't the only thing that are available to you in your performance toolkit. The first thing you might jump into is something like local profiling. So these are like the kind of tools that you would use in your local development environment. And they're going to take advantage of like debuggability and give you more accurate, more detailed diagnostic data. It's going to give you insights into where your critical code paths are. And so some examples of this are like SysTrace, method profiling pictured below. Um, but this is a manual process, right? And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it's just that if we want a measurement that we can iterate on and maintain, then we're gonna need to look a little further. So that brings us to like analytics, right? Like analytics are, are, are another like obvious thing that we can try. Um, and these are like performance metrics from like real users. 
And um, it's easy to set up a monitor, and I, and, and I know a lot of people who deal with analytics are probably rolling their eyes right now. But given an existing analytics pipeline, um, you know, adding an additional metric is usually not that much of an additional cost. Um, and most people have like analytics in their app. Um, so it's kind of nice to be able to just like add an additional metric and, and get, get up and running, and you can integrate directly with your existing analytics dashboards. Um, but you're gonna have a slower feedback loop as a result of this. Um, you're gonna have to wait for your app to get pushed out for users to adopt it, and then have enough of those users to hit that like critical code path until you get a statistically significant amount of data that you can actually iterate on. And the worst part of this is that your users are actually gonna hit these regressions before you're actually able to solve them. So if you care about your users, well, okay, well maybe this is not the only tool that we need to consider. And that brings us to benchmarks, right? Um, and by benchmarks, I really mean like um, separate thing that you have to like develop that's not, not core to the functionality of your app. It's gonna measure your code in a loop. They're kind of like the performance analogy to uh, correctness tests, which is like a really hand wavy thing um, because correctness tests kind of give you this like pass fail signal, but um, benchmarks kind of give you like this measurement, right? A scalar value that you, that you can kind of like uh, look, look at. Um, but like tests, these are things that we can run side by side as we're developing to maintain code. And it's gonna allow us to iterate quickly. We can like tweak things in our app, run the benchmark, tweak, tweak another thing, run the benchmark again, see how things changed, uh, whether better or worse, so that's, so that's nice. Um, and this is something that we can run as we're developing and as we create builds in our continuous integration system, um, in, our, in our development workflow, and we can actually monitor and fix these regressions before they hit production, so that solves that problem. But there's a higher development cost here. This is like a separate pipeline that you have to invest in. Benchmarks are a separate piece of code that you're gonna have to write and maintain. Um, so that's kind of like the downside there. And so the typical workflow might look something like, you know, you get a report from quality assurance or maybe a user review, then you'll take out your local profiling tools, dig in, figure out what your critical code paths are, write some benchmarks around that, iterate it, make it better, then write some analytics to make sure that things uh, actually got better for your users. Um, but those are just some pros and cons of different tools that are available. But this talks about benchmarks. And that's a little bit about why benchmarks are useful and, and, and benchmarks in general. Um, and now Chris is gonna tell us a little bit uh, how they work in CI. All right, so Dustin talks us about how benchmarks work and what we'd like to get out of them. So let's talk about how we actually go about using benchmarking in UI, in CI. So let's look at the goals here. Uh, first and foremost, we wanna maintain quality as changes land. Similar to running tests in CI, we want things to stay good instead of having to fix them over and over again. We want to also provide blame granularity on regressions that's relatively, uh, that's relatively detailed. We want to be able to see, oh look, we have, um, we have these three changes that landed. In between those, um, these two, performance got worse. That's really what we're after here. Um, and then we also want to try and reuse as much as possible infrastructure from correctness tests, because if you have correctness tests running in CI, we'd like to be able to reuse much of that for benchmarking. So let's talk a little bit about correctness tests here, just to, just to set up what we're talking about. Here's an example of test dashboard. This is actually the, the test dashboard for, for Jetpack as of a few days ago. Um, and you can see that although we have um, tens of thousands of tests running in CI, we actually have a very nice, concise view of that because correctness tests scale pretty nicely. You really don't care about all the tests that are passing. You really only need visibility into the ones that are failing. And so we collapse all the packages that uh, all of our modules that don't have failing tests and we only show those that do. And that allows you to say at a very quick glance, oh look, there's one flaky test in this one package and one failing test in another. Really easy to see at a glance. However, let's talk about what this would look like for benchmarking. How do, how do we get a benchmarking dashboard that says the exact same amount of information concisely? Well. First of all, benchmarks, as Dustin mentioned, are a scalar value. It is, a num it, it is some sort of floating point number. It is not a pass or a fail. It is really easy to collapse Booleans in a way that doesn't work here. Um, we would like a test dashboard to work with pass-fail signals like that, but we don't have those. So how do we get a pass-fail signal out of a benchmark? So let's go ahead and look at all the benchmark results from um, the entire Jetpack, uh, the entire suite of Jetpack libraries, and kind of maybe we can see some patterns here. Maybe we can discern some of this vin uh, visually because after all, you're going to have way fewer benchmarks than you are going to have correctness tests. You only really need benchmarks around the critical parts of your code that need to stay fast. Now, there's a whole lot of, of information here, but like really, you've got room benchmarks at the very top that are taking seconds to run, whereas there are tiny little benchmarks at the very bottom that take nanoseconds. So, okay, let's scale this around. Uh, let, let, let's try and normalize this a bit and so that maybe we can see some patterns pop out there. Oh my goodness, no, that is entirely useless. There's just so much noise in all of these things, and what really is happening here, and that I wanna call out, is that a lot of these are individual noisy benchmarks, but like the one, the work manager sample that uh, Dustin showed before, that's this, that you've got tests that are stable and useful 
running in here, but the noise just makes up so much visual noise that you can't see them. So we've got to have some sort of more automated way to get through this. So how do we detect performance regressions? Um, so let's, let's restate the problem here. We manually inspecting that will absolutely not scale. Uh, benchmarks return a scalar value, and we need to somehow get a pass-fail from that. So a naive, simple approach to this might be saying, oh, okay, well, I really only care about big regressions. Small ones are likely going to be noise, so let's set a threshold that's a percentage. Um, what if I say 20% is a failure? If anything goes up by 20%, then that's a failure. Well, here, here's a sample benchmark, and that, that, that um, particular pattern works pretty well. We've got a big regression here in the middle, plus 88%. That's a huge regression. We've got a little bit of noise afterward, but that's on the, on the scale of 13 and 12%, so not a big deal. In, in this particular case, regression is caught, and the little minor fluke that happened there that doesn't continue on after that, great, we're fine. Um, we caught the regression, and we ignored the fluke. However, this doesn't necessarily scale to all sorts of benchmark data that you get. So if you have a particularly stable benchmark that, that looks very uh, solid and then just goes up by a little bit, that might be a really critical component of your app that's really stable in CI, but a 15% regression is completely ignored by this 20% threshold. This benchmark wants a completely different strategy for determining a regression than the previous one did. Or here's another example that this happens all the time in CI. You might have seen that before on the uh, graphs from before, but you have a temporary spike that occurs where some sort of interference to the benchmark while it's running on the device causes a big spike upward. It'll say, in this case, 115% increase in runtime, but then it goes back down immediately. Now, what probably, now possibly someone checked in a regression and immediately reverted it, but what very often happens here in practice is that you just get bad data from CI, and that's okay. We can work around that, but in this case, if we try and use this naive approach, it looks like a regression, and if this happens across every single test, you're telling every single test owner, hey, look, you've got a performance regression and wasting everyone's time. So variance is the core problem here, and, uh, and, and the core part of the problem is that it is inconsistent between different benchmarks. Different benchmarks will behave differently and have different amounts of variance when they're running in CI. So performance ba uh, percentage based thresholds don't really work very well. They, they trigger false alerts, and they'll also miss real regressions in stable benchmarks that could tell you much more granularly a small regression. Um, and then functionally, interference spikes are a fact of life. Here's some more real data from, um, I think this was, a combination of recycler view, ads identifier, and maybe um, and, and another library that doesn't come to my mind right now, but, but completely unrelated libraries in Jetpack that all spiked on the exact same build. Now, there wasn't any change in here that caused this particular problem, but this is just, these are results from our CI. It just went bad for a build. How do we, how, how do we deal with that? So we need to be able to handle temporary instability. Um, we want to avoid manually tuning per benchmark, because man, that would not be a lot of fun. Um, but we do want accuracy. We want to be able to catch those regressions that we talked about before, both the large, the large one and the small one. So let me talk a little bit about what we do in Jetpack, the approach that we call step, step fitting. So first and foremost, a regression will over time look like a step upward in your benchmark results. They were relatively stable at one value, and then they increased significantly over time. So and here on the graph, to the right you see um, more and more builds landing, more and more numbers coming out of it, and that, that highlighted build pretty clearly looks like a regression. Um, so what we want to do here is we want to look at, we want to test a hypothesis. Is this particular build a regression? So, for, so there are two aspects that we want to consider here. First of all, the gap in between the before and after is a significant indicator that we are confident that this is a regression. If there's a big gap, then we are pretty confident. If there is variance, either before or after, then that should proportionally reduce our confidence. So step fit is an algorithm that we have that, mat that looks at a series of builds over time, not just in and in plus one, but a wider range than that, to try and gain a confidence number about how much we think a regression has happened for a particular build. Um, we want to avoid po false positives for one-off slow runs, and by looking at multiple builds, we can do that. We inspect multiple data points all at once, and we report a confidence of a regression across multiple builds um, against an alert threshold. So let's look at what this actually looks like um, running in RCI. So over time, you get several builds landing that take a relatively stable amount of time. You've got several builds landing, more and more results. Oh, you've got a big spike here. We've got a regression, right? Well, no, actually, that was just a spike. Not a big deal. We can ignore that. Um, 
But let's look and see how, how the step fit uh, approach will, will look and uh, re report here. So first of all, we want to test this build, not the most recent build, but several builds ago if it's a regression. We split up the data set into before the build and after the build, and we feed this into the step fit algorithm. In, the, in this particular case, there's not a big difference between the before and after, so regression equals false. We don't really worry too much about this um, spike. And again, as we continue and more results land, we say, oh, nope, that's not a regression. We don't have a high confidence. But over time, as we move further and further and we start getting more and more results that are stably looking like a regression, looking like that step fit, once we get to that particular point, we say, hey, look, that's a regression. I have high confidence. So to summarize, let me talk, let me talk about like, the workflow again, as Dustin mentioned it. So first and foremost, when you see a problem, start with local profiling. That is absolutely the first place to go to because profiling shows you what is wrong. Benchmarking can be useful in that case if you want to be able to iterate really quickly. Um, you know, hit the run button on your test and see whether it passes or fails, just like you would do with a unit test. Um, but with a benchmark, you're looking for optim optimizing whatever that problem is. However, after optimizing, consider monitoring. This is how you can prevent this problem from happening again in the future. And analytics are a great option for this, but as Dustin mentioned before, if you are only using analytics, then you are waiting until users hit the problem before you fix it. With benchmarks in CI, you can avoid that by catching them early, catching them before you ship to your users. So if you do want to run with your benchmarks in continuous integration, then you can try it out for yourself. Um, first and foremost, we suggest run it on real devices, not emulators. Um, this, helps you, this helps you match the actual performance that you'd see in the wild much more closely. Um, we have our, our library outputs metrics in JSON, a lot of information about like the distribution and various things, and you can collect all of those, use the step fit algorithm in order to detect more regressions. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the step fit algorithm, there was a blog post last week that I posted, um, and you can find out about that on d.android.com slash benchmark. That's got all the information that you need, how to get it set up, how to get it running in CI, how to even build it if you're not using Gradle, all sorts of information. We've got docs for the library, um, we have a sample on GitHub that shows not just how to use the library, but how to use it alongside Recycler View, which is a really um, great way to monitor performance there. Um, and we've also got a link to that blog post about regression detection with sample code that shows you exactly how we do that with some sample data from Jetpack CI as well. Um, the 1.0 release candidate is out today, so please give it a try. And uh, thank you very much. We are going to be upstairs if you have any questions. <laughs>